function now in breast cancer like we did even six or seven years ago. So if we look at uh, solid tumor metastasis, uh, maybe uh, the majority of patients with metastasis, the skeleton is involved. And as we continue to make cancer more of a chronic condition, so we're seeing more unusual patterns of metastasis. So this was just a survey uh, of patients who had the <coughs> metastasis uh, uh, causing uh, a suspicion of spinal cord compression. And of course, the usual um, uh, uh, suspects uh, are uh, lung, uh, prostate, uh, breast, myeloma, with renal uh, in, in, a, in a creditable fifth position. But this presumably will continue uh, to change as time goes by. Uh, there are advances in the management of lung cancer, it's best not to smoke uh, still, and in prostate cancer we're going to see that increase, we're going to see uh, breast cancer uh, probably becoming even more of a chronic uh, condition uh, than we've done in the past. And these are the new kids on the block that I mentioned to you, and I'm very happy uh, for this talk to be emailed to anybody who is sad enough to want to actually uh, look at it <laughs> again. Uh, but, you know, we're all different, and uh, God bless you if you do. But the uh, <laughs> bottom uh, line is uh, that these are, are just some of the nibs uh, that are being used. Very successful means they'll cancer. I was asked to see a man. Uh, the other day got brain met uh, from his renal cancer, and he's been living with metastatic renal cancer for eight years. Uh, extensive renal cancer, he had responses, and he had the most wonderful quality of life. Now he's got this huge brain met, and the question is, should we give him some focal radiotherapy or not? And he was just started on this panzapanib. And I did another scan, and on that panzapanib, this tumor, this cerebral met from renal cell cancer was responding. How do you never see that? And uh, unfortunately, it's a very vascular tumor between the cell carcinoma. And what suddenly happened in between me seeing him one week and the next week, he suddenly had a massive and was a fatal bleed from this responding renal metastasis in his brain. He just suddenly bled. For him, it was an instant death. It just came a bit hard for the family because I had given them the, uh, the lyrics that he was doing remarkably well, and if we did this, maybe we could do the other but we were playing with fire, and that was the case. Prostate cancer, again, these are dramatic uh, additions to the element. Bladder cancer, uh, and in myeloma. So if we look between 1997 and 2013, uh, we can see there's a marked improvement in survival. Uh, the median survival has gone up from two years to five years, and now, maybe a fifth of patients will live 10 years after a diagnosis of myeloma. Mm -hmm. And uh, FIT here does, is not referring to whether you're eye candy or not. But FIT here is uh, <laughs> something with performance status. Uh, and uh, again, thalidomide, isn't that remarkable? Thalidomide, you know, with all the tragedy that thalidomide uh, produced when it was being used as uh, um, an anti-nauseant um, uh, in, in uh, the early stage of pregnancy uh, now is, is used uh, as an anti-angiogenic uh, drug. Truly remarkable. Uh, that's why medicine is so fascinating. You think you know things and then the next morning you wake up and you realize you know nothing. Uh, and then the second line treatments and then you've got all these other uh, drugs uh, coming up uh, and it is truly exciting as we're uh, understanding more about the cell cycle, in normal conditions, and also about what happens in terms of the cancerous condition. Uh, the problem, of course, in all of this, and we can get very excited, improve survival, in metastatic colorectal cancer went up from six months, uh, four or five years ago, is now 24 months. So people are living longer with their cancer. It produces other problems, of course. I'm just talking about the medical problem but uh, it will produce other problems. And uh, all these uh, drugs are being used. Molecular biology is coming up. Esophageal cancer, we've made very little inroads on esophageal cancer, which is starting to increase in uh, incidence again, especially in women in the lower third. Uh, 
whether that's, a, again, indirectly related to obesity and acid reflux, I, mean, I don't know. But um, we are all the time trying to do things. If we come back to spinal cord compression, the level at which you get the spinal cord compression varies, but it's normally around about uh, T6 in the middle of the spine. And I know that uh, you yourselves have been very much involved in this. And the whole issue, of course, is that if you can uh, detect this early, then you may be able to do something about it. And that uh, I think doctors, never mind anybody else, but doctors in general have been appalling at trying to uh, understand uh, about spinal cord uh, com compression uh, and how to uh, manage it. And one of the amazing things that has come up was something when it started uh, were these bisphosphonates and we used to have those tablets, didn't we, of uh, Lauron or um, um, something else that I forgot made people terribly sick. And not least because they got stuck in your pharynx as you tried to swallow them, these huge great pill bone fobs. Uh, that whether this would make any difference. And I was very, very cynical uh, and um, doubting at the beginning. But over the last 10 years, we've seen these bisphosphonates, which are not an anti-cancer drug per se, of course, are used to uh, inhibit osteoclast formation. We found we now have intravenous drugs, Zermita, uh, and they're more superior to oral drugs. We know that now for a fact. There is some toxicity, you have to be careful of renal function with most of these. And of course, every now and again, 1%, you'll get a terrible ulcer uh, in the jaw, a horrible osteonecrotic ulcer of the jaw. But already, we have saw a survival advantage in bisphosphonates in people with myeloma. So if you can keep the skeleton intact for longer, that actually has now been shown to have an uh, impact on survival. And there's all sorts of research uh, that uh, is begging to be done from patient access, as I mentioned, that if you really can't get to a center where people are thinking or are able to help you, then you're probably not going to do quite so well. That's why the Royal Marsden Hospital is in Chelsea and in Sutton in Surrey, which of course to most of the uh, deprived areas in the world. <laughs> um, and what you can see research here, calcium vitamin D, uh, uh, duration, and the interval of alpha you give them. So there's lots to do. And just to mention the SRE is if something bad happens to your bone, never mind quite how it is, but spinal cord compression is one of it. And uh, we see that these SREs are common and frequent in patients with advanced uh, cancer who are untreated for bone metastasis. So if we look at breast cancer within 24 months, two thirds of patients, something bad will happen to their bones. Prostate, half, lung, and other solid tumors, half. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, is a real problem. And if you look at the hospital length of stay for patients, by the presence of bone metastasis or not, you will see that uh, the mean length of stay uh, with bone metastasis, um, I don't understand that slide, ignore it. Uh, <laughs> as, we, uh, as we go on, uh, we can see that this drug denosinab, I just want to mention to you, is remarkable in the sense that it can be given subcutaneously, it's given every four weeks. You don't have to worry what the renal function is. Uh, so that's a real value. It will drop your calcium quite quickly, uh, and you have to be careful of linear fractures in the femur in about 1% uh, of patients, and it will give you a 1% risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw. But this is a very significant development in keeping people mobile uh, and to help them with their pain who've got squeezed metastasis. So if you do a forest plot, all these things we look at uh, compared with the IV zoledronic acid, which is particularly good in prostate cancer, uh, we can see that generally it's the positive side uh, of, of the line. Now, saying no to chemotherapy can be very difficult. And just for the last uh, few minutes, uh, I just want to uh, highlight something that Des Spence in uh, his sort of personal view, is a personal view most weeks at the back of the BMJ. And uh, before I die, I've got to do a whole lot of clearing out. 
I mean, the children have told me quite clearly that uh, if anything happened to me, that they would arrange for a skip to be delivered every day for a week. And they'd start on the Monday and they'd do one skip, and then they would do it on a Tuesday, and on a Wednesday, and a Thursday, and a Friday, and then it would be fine, and the place would be realistic for my wife to be able to live in. And they would move her to somewhere where she'd like to live. Um, and I had a terrible nightmare uh, and woke up. And every now and again, there have been about three or four nightmares I've had in my life. And it's taken me a while to realize it actually wasn't true. And uh, I woke up and I had forgotten that my wife had died. And I was living by myself. And there was a knock at the door. And as I went there, the three children were there. And I said, oh, hello, why didn't you phone? It's nice to see you come and make a cup of tea. We haven't got time for that, Dad, they said. And uh, they came and said, we need to talk to you. So I said, oh, is everything all right? They said, yes, everything's fine. They sat down, and they sat down, and they had this small little walnut box. And I said, oh, that looks nice. That's kind of you to bring it. He said, it's not, well, it's not for you now. So I said, what do you mean it's not for you now? They said, well, we've got 15 minutes. And you just got to work out what you want to keep, and you just put it in this box, and then we've got somewhere nice for you to live. Um, and this whole question of saying no to chemotherapy, thinking things through prospectively, saying no to chemotherapy. And uh, of course it's huge. It's huge. Because of all the, all the, um, all the thoughts, all the uh, premises, all the assumptions that have been made by the patient, but particularly about the family. You know, when you read the Daily Mail, or you listen to the news, or you know, you go shopping, and everybody, if you're having chemotherapy, there's hope. You know, there's something new, and all this business. And there's some truth in that, but it's limited truth. And therefore, the converse of the tile is if I don't have chemotherapy, then there is no hope. Uh, well, if life is a sexually transmitted uh, fatal condition, well, there's no hope, really, as soon as you're born. I know I'm over-making the point, but it's true. We are born to die. But we're in a society where the biggest uh, uh, taboo isn't open, naked, homosexual sex, but to talk about death. It's a big taboo. Talk about death and people just walk away from you. Uh, and I think that when, you, when we have these patients, of course, we bring, as doctors, we bring our own presumptions as well. There was a meeting on Thursday and some idiot stood up and went on and on and on and on. And I think most people in the room thought, yeah, I've got a clue. And this chap's was talking about how wonderful all his treatment was. And, and other people were thinking, I think you're really overselling this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have a problem as medics in saying no to chemotherapy. We feel a sense of failure. We're here to help you. This is what we can do. I'm a hammer, you're a nail. Uh, but there is more to it than that. And I think Des Spence has showed this, and uh, I actually resonated with this. I showed it to a, a colleague of mine, uh, and he actually said, when I looked at him, he just gave it back to me and said, bullshit. And uh, I wasn't quite sure how, uh, well, that meant really, but he obviously didn't disagree. He disagreed strongly with what Des Spence was saying. But this is a question about quality of life, and what is quality of life? I don't want to sit in that patients in a hospital. I really just don't want to. Um, and I, I, I hope I have enough family and friends that I don't need to get my support from the lovely WRBST lady who actually can only <laughs> work for two hours every other day uh, because they can't get anybody else to do the work as well. Um, tennis is a hospital. Toxicity, our toxicity at times is really very bad. One of our worst toxicities uh, which we don't really register because we can't do anything about it. So why, why record something you can't do anything about? Uh, is, is fatigue. Fatigue and depression, insomnia, sore mouth, things that really matter. Um, rather than the fact that your x-ray shows that the tumor is actually two centimeters smaller than it was. Now that's, that's better to be two centimeters smaller than bigger, but 
do I feel any better for it? And what does it mean? Can you say I'm going to live longer? Maybe, but not necessarily. And this question about unrealistic expectations. I was, uh, had a terrible time on Monday afternoon. I was asked to see this uh, young 24-year-old with a rare condition. But the people who looked after her up until she came to see me hadn't told her that because the scan showed some uptake in the skeleton, that this was incurable. But as she came to talk to me and was just said, well, that's fantastic, so we'll have a dose of this and everything will be okay. As I started to talk to her, I realized that they were getting married this Saturday. And I thought, if there was any a wrong time for anybody to come to see me, it's four days before you get married. So we had to handle that badly, really. Um, and this current guideline mores, we just go down the guideline. And if we can do that, then, well, anybody really can do our job. I mean, you just open the book, and you read from one to five, and you turn over, and we carry on. Anyone can do that. It's not clever. And so, to a certain extent, I am actually with uh, Des Spence uh, on this, saying no uh, to treatment. And I think, that, as always, it's money and the law that brings us to our common sense. Um, if you want to change and the GMC can do the edicts, but it's the lawyers that really change practice. You just need a few people to have some highlighted cases in the, uh, in the uh, strand. And I tell you, enough get round quickly uh, that you, uh, you'll get your legs bitten uh, rather than just not following the guideline. And also in terms of money. And uh, the treatment of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia again has been revolutionized in the last 15 years, a particular drug called Gleevec which has dramatically changed it. And these are new drugs that have come out, and this is what it's going to cost. We cannot afford it. We just cannot afford it. And it really begs questions about financial cost. And it's very interesting that even just coming down here at the uh, half past um, <coughs> 10 uh, news bulletin, they were saying that whatever says we need another 30 billion by the end of the decade for the health service, and therefore we're going to have to have uh, conferences as to what we can afford and what we can't afford in terms of the uh, NHS. And uh, at the moment, NICE have something where they say that if you've got a new treatment for £30,000, which will give you a quality, I'm not quite sure what the quality is, but it's like a good year, a good extra year of life and only costs £30,000. And uh, you don't lose your microphone. Um, that's fine. And it's quite sobering to think how much money is spent in the last nine months of life. Uh, and I think it's something like 75% uh, of, uh, of hospital expenditure is spent in people in their last nine months of life. Um, and I found it very interesting when they came across that statistic as opposed to the first nine months of life, i.e. in utero. So it, it, is, it is very interesting. And in terms of our future economy, I think prevention is always better than cure. You know, prevention is so much better than cure. Why did it take so long before there was a ban of smoking in a public place? I mean, why do we let people walk around and let their dogs crap on the street? I mean, why do we do it? I mean, why do we do it as a, as a civilized society? Why in God's name do we do it? Uh, and in terms of obstetrics, uh, and, and childcare, that will be sacrosanct, of course, and might be so. And to a certain extent, we're almost going to have to look at ourselves as a society as if we were a two-thirds world society. Probably because we are. Probably because we are. And I think the, uh, the economic uh, reality has really hit us very hard in the last four or five years, but it's here to stay. It's not going to change, it's here to stay. We're seeing numbers vastly go up in A&E, and that is going to continue. And so what the uh, shape of emergency care is going to be is going to change. And uh, the question is, where is cancer going to be in this? And I think uh, cancer will be in it, but I think it will uh, it'll be, uh, it'll be hedged round. And so in health economics, uh, we're going to have uh, a price for a national, uh, to get well, to keep well, and it is going to have to be uh, affordable. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Well, it's very important in any talk that you finish, and it's very important you finish uh, on time. Um, and it really does uh, raise this question about active treatment. And I think it is actually very difficult uh, when patients come to you. If you look at the patient, the pressure's on the patient. The patient I saw this morning, and she said to me, I'm under tremendous, we weren't her words, she said, I'm under tremendous pressure from my husband because he, he's very worried I'm not eating. And this was clearly getting to her, her husband's anxiety and she's not eating. The whole concept of eating is very interesting, isn't it? You know, you'll eat up your dinner like a good boy, won't you, for mummy, eat your dinner. And that's sort of drilled into you until you can take solid. If you're not feeding, it causes tremendous anxiety. Of course it does. I mean, there's a logical aspect to it, but there's an emotional aspect to it as well, uh, which I don't understand. So the patient comes, and the patient's not alone. And the patient brings their own, uh, their own experiences, most of which are subconscious, their own fears, their own individuality, and they bring their own family. Unfortunately, I have a saying which says, where there's a will, there's a family. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes uh, different people come and, uh, anyway, that, that's, that's going to be chapter 97 in my mind camp when it comes out. Uh, of uh, amazing uh, situations we've had. But it is, I think, very important to be honest. And how, this question about communication, how do you communicate to a woman that if you have chemotherapy as adjuvant for breast cancer, there is a 3.8% improvement in survival. How do you do that? I would love to have 100 consultants to do that in front of me, and I will score them, and I'll give them half an hour to do it. And we'd have other people sit down and think, did you work out what that meant? What did that mean to you? You've got a 3.8% improvement in survival if you have this chemotherapy. And I think it's very difficult. I find it exceedingly difficult. And I draw pictures, and I try and explain it, and I'm sure I get it wrong far more times than I get it right. And at the end of it, I'll say it, and I think the patient's going to say no, say, oh, that's fine, then when do I start? <laughs> so I thought, I wish I hadn't spent 20 minutes going through all that, because you clearly made your mind up. But I didn't know that, and I had to sort of uh, try and uh, listen uh, as to where they were coming from. And this, this question about when to treat and when not to treat is, is very, very difficult. And I have to say, I have been so grateful to colleagues uh, like yourselves who are supportive of families and can give a whole new dimension as to where the patient is, where the patient's coming from, and where the family are coming from, and the pressures that are on. And uh, there are some patients that I'm sure would like to be relieved from the burden of visiting the hospital regularly and the burden of treatment earlier, but they just don't feel empowered or brave enough to be able to say, excuse me, can I have a, can I have a rest? So a patient on Tuesday, I mean, God knows why she went down to see this idiot in uh, wherever she went to see him. And uh, she came back, I mean, she doesn't live far from here, and she's been amazing. I've given her chemotherapy in the past. The first time I gave her, she was one of the 3% on Cape Side to be, everything falls apart. I gave her something more gentle the second time, she had a terrible time. The lethargy was terrible. She had an incurable cancer. And we said, look, let's stop. She got back to horse riding. She had a fantastic time. She moved near her daughter. A great time with her grandchildren. And now a cousin has said, oh, if you come to see so-and-so in so-and-so street, in London, WC1. <laughs> he uh, will uh, be able to uh, give you some treatment that will make all the difference. He's too right, it will make all the difference. And when she came to me, she just talked about this. And I just had to be very professional instead of saying, you must be absolutely out of your mind. Uh, to sort of say, well, yes, that's a possibility. Yes, we will consider all our options and da 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 da. But it would be, I mean, a killer. If she has one cycle of that, she'll be dead within six weeks, if not sooner. And uh, yet somebody has dropped this into her mind. Her family are desperate for her not to have it. But some well-meaning 
not that close relative has now put this seed of doubt into her mind just at the time she didn't need it. And she's just got to work this through. And uh, it's, it's tragic, isn't it? That, you know, I, I know, as, if I wish I would knew what I know now when I started off, um, I wish I'd had my grandchildren before I had my children, but <laughs> life's not like that. So we are grateful that we work as a team, and it's very important that you feed back and that you, you give us insights and give team insights as to where you think a particular patient is. And I would thank uh, many of you for the wonderful care that you've given to quite many of our patients, and particularly my patients, uh, uh, certainly in, in this part of the parish. So thank you very much.